Oh, well, welcome back to another episode of Growth Vertical, everyone. We have a special episode today because we're going to be talking about a particular topic around SEO, which is very important, very impactful. And this is going to be with a special guest, David Finberg, here from Peaks Digital Marketing, who has an SEO agency, runs an SEO agency based in Denver, Colorado. Is that right, David? That's correct. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about a particular topic, the importance of creating an SEO roadmap to guide strategic, timely and measurable ROI driven results, right? So how do we actually use SEO? How do we start with it? How do we get started with SEO? And how do we actually reach our end goal for our particular businesses, whether it's to, let's say, generate more revenue, maybe we need more awareness, like depending on that goal, you need more traffic coming to your site. Like how do we actually get there at the end? And we're going to be talking about I guess the nuance is behind how you would set that sort of plan up and we'll be discussing why it's so important. So thanks, David, for joining us. You know, it's really great to have you here on the show. Um, I feel like there's going to be a definite, you know, good amount of value that's going to come out of this conversation. Re reason why is because I know you've been doing this for some time, right? Um, and it's going to be on a great topic too, right, that we're talking about today. But before we get into it, I kind of want to hear about yourself, right? So kind of want the audience to hear about you know, what you do, who you are, why did you start Peaks Digital Marketing and what's the goal here for you, right? I love that. Thanks. First and foremost, thanks so much for having me on. This is a really exciting opportunity. Um, a, a little bit of background, you know, I started um, when I was just nine or 10 years old building websites, right? So I was always a techie kind of nerdy kid. And, you know, my dad was a computer engineer and he, you know, got a 90 megahertz computer back in 1990 and a 28 eight internet connection. I started just playing around on the web, right? And that's where a lot of people started, right? Just kind of testing and, and playing around and, you know, start out with GeoCities and AngelFire. There were these like free websites that you could make. And I, I basically were, was, you know, showing my friends and family like, hey, I'm, I'm making this website. Here's my website. And I remember my granddad said, you know, I would love a website. Can I pay you $20 to make you know, a, a chef, I, he was a chef. So I said, you know, can, can you, can I pay you 20 bucks to create me a website? And I said, absolutely. So that's really where kind of the, the love affair started with the internet and, and creating content and being able to, um, you know, create value for people online. Uh, me personally, I love the outdoors. Um, you know, I'm out here in Denver where, uh, you, you know, it's, it's cold, but it's not as cold as people think. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in, in growing up in the car industry, which a lot of people don't know. So I started as, as more of a technician, right? Like a, I'm a very kind of analytical, um, you know, nuts and bolts kind of guy. And that's where, you know, it was really interesting to see kind of that, that pivot. When I was younger, I was more into the computers and I got back into the cars. And then, you know, once I gained this, this great, amazing experience in the car industry, I was able to, to then apply that back into the computer industry. So, um, you know, I love looking at new pieces of technology. I've always been, you know, kind of a technophile, right? And uh, I, on the other end, I, I turn off. I like to get outdoors and go on hikes and spend time with my dog, Zorro, and, yeah. you know, get to get to travel a bit. But truly, like, you know, I just, you just couldn't keep me away from the computer. And, and where I am today is is now obviously managing a, a an agency. We have about 15 people on staff, right? We work with companies, um, you know, on the local level, all the way to international level. And so, um, no matter who, where you fall in this podcast, there's going to be some really awesome value and I'll be able to, to, you know, dive into some of the experiences that I had growing the digital side in addition to, you know, the hacks, the ticks, the tips and the tricks that everyone also wants to, um, explore. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's more or less me in a nutshell. You know, I, I'm super technical. I, I found that way to marry also some of the technical aspects of what I do with the people. Um, right. People are, are the most important and then the tech comes second. Right. So, uh, a lot of this is, is also going to be, uh, you know, more of a pragmatic approach mm -hmm. into how to manage, you know, whether you have a team or you're a solopreneur, you have, you know, uh, uh, you're just a director in the company and you're a sole director and you need to, to figure out some strategies. Um, you know, there's, there's wins here for everyone, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's more or less, you know, my background. So that's, thanks for actually that, that introduction, because it's actually, it sounds quite familiar, right? And I can sort of attest to that as well, considering, so I was a tech consultant before, and then I moved into digital marketing. And it's almost like when you, when technical meets, you want to be creative sort of thing and actually provide, you know, 
the the end result for some for people, right? That's when you understand, hey, well, you know, things like SEO come on radar, things like PPC come on the radar, and then to do it for a technical industry, which I believe your agency works around along the financial services and, and medical industry predominantly, right? Uh, with, exactly. with some exposure to other industries as well. And so, exactly. yeah, I've, I've sort of got into that similar mindset where it's moving over from technical side and then like loving the actual technical aspects of marketing, right? Be it growth marketing, be it SEO and PPC. And that's what's interesting. I think a lot of people re- don't realize that with SEO, it's, a, it's, quite a, it's quite technical, right? You need some specialists involved to like work with that because it's an ongoing process. It's not like a set and forget type thing. It's, we're talking about ongoing tweaks. We're talking about keeping up with the market. We're talking about um, actually adhering to what these big giants like Google and, and Yahoo and, and whatnot are actually producing right on a daily basis, the tech behind what they're actually producing uh, and how that can help us sort of disseminate some information, right, to one another. A hundred percent. So It's amazing. Yeah, I, exactly. And But I think that with the B2B, the B2B side, right? It's, it's different saying B2C versus B2B on the SEO front, right? Like to compare those two. So what do you think like seems to be, one thing will be interesting though, is what do you think seems to be like the main problem right now for B2B SEO, especially like companies starting out with startups? I, I do think, you know, touching on some of the technical aspects, right? It's, it's very easy to, um, to create an experience now that that is centered around a, a, a product. And I think B2B, it's a different type of content. It's a different type of strategy. Mm-hmm. It's also a different, in some cases, like sales cycle, right? Whereas it's not as someone typically going and just hitting the buy button, right? They might need to speak to a sales rep or they might need to really learn and, and compare and just like a, a normal customer would, right? But to a, to the nth degree. And then they're taking that information back and, and you know, making an educated decision with, with their leadership team or with their their boss or whoever, right? And so I think a lot of, of B2B strategies, they need to be timely, targeted, right? And you also really need to um, consider like, you know, if we're competing with um, a larger company in the space, like what is our competitive advantage and how are we positioning ourselves, um, not only from an SEO position, but, but more of like a, 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 a desires position for, you know, if we're marketing to another business, right? Like the, the level of scrutiny is probably going to be a, a little bit higher and the, the way that we're positioning these products um, needs to be done delicately, right? And so a lot of the times, you know, some some businesses might be dealing with both where they're dealing with B2C and B2B and, and some of the waters can can be muddied there when when you have products that can be positioned to directly to a customer, but then we're trying to sell more of a solution or an, or, or an end goal, um, you know, to, to a, business or an enterprise right now, uh, it becomes um, a situation where where the key highlights and the key differentiators may be totally different, right? It may be more about the management and, you know, the data, the analytics or the reporting in, in the case of SEO, mm-hmm. or, you know, if you're selling um, professional services, right? Like making sure that that they're going to have that that full fractionalized team and support. And so it's, it's like, hey, we know we need SEO, we know we need um, your product, whether it's, you know, uh, a widget or, or a large scale product or service. Now, how are we really attacking that from a content perspective and, and really researching, right? I think there's there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of white papers and, and just having like a lot more supporting content and different ways for people to, to go in that funnel. Um, real quick, like one thing that I, I talk about in this, whether it's B2C or B2B, you have different stages of that buying cycle, right? Some people are in the discovery stage and some people are, are in the buying stage. Some people are like, you know, beyond the buying stage and they're looking for the next step. And so mm-hmm. typically, um, you know, that discovery phase, there's there's a lot of different ways that people can discover your brand. And when you're more of a B to, to be brand, your focus is is typically on, on supporting that journey no matter where they come from, having more of an omni-channel approach, right? So if you're, um, you know, mapping out almost your content, it's, it's really important to have like use cases and practical application of these products in a context of whatever niche or, or, or market that you're serving. Um, and that can be more difficult when you're selling a, a, a more broad service. Like for example, you know, there's a company um, that we did, that we're doing work for that does some, um, you know, hosting and they do a lot of enterprise hosting. They do a lot of, um, you know, B2C hosting where someone might just want to buy a dedicated server or VPS. And so those two segments are totally different, right? And, and the way that you approach those segments 
um, needs to be done intentionally. And, and usually what people start doing is they just start churning out content, churning out content. And that's where I think the, the SEO and, and the data and analytics can really help um, get the most out of your campaign is, you know, we're in a culture of today where it's like we need to move fast and we need to get things up and let's go ahead and, and start moving. And I, I'm a true believer of version version done is better than version none mm-hmm. on the reverse end where I see, you know, people moving, whether it's a smaller business that's more agile or a big ship with a small rudder where maybe they're not as agile because they're moving so quickly and forgetting some of the strategy, right? Like how do we take a complete snapshot and really know what are our customers' pain points, right? Like have we looked at core? Have we looked at answer the public? Are we using SEM rush or, or tools um, that can help us, you know, really uncover what are those like top five to 10 questions. And so, um, looking at you know b2b versus b2c i think that what you'll find is that the questions in a in a b2b context are um you know much more like revenue driven and kind of practical and, and less about the product and more about what the product's you know interaction with their business is going to be right versus a customer right is it's more you know comprehensive to look at a product page and really understand okay it has these features and here's you know the the the, the playground in which I can use this, whereas an enterprise may have um, bigger requirements or a smaller business may have bigger requirements just due to the fact that, that they need, you know, greater le- levels of detail and how this is going to, going to work and interact with them. And so um, uncovering those pain points, I think is the, is the golden opportunity. It's traditional marketing, right? We can use tools, um, use things like Google trends and really see where, you know, what are the buzzwords that are being used in your industry that, um, are kind of coming around the bend, right? Like we don't want to be talking about yesterday's marketing. We want to be talking about where the market's going and, and how we can position ourselves as a thought leader and, and compete, whether we're on a, a, a local or national or international level. So um, I'd say for, for most people, you're probably, we're probably going to focus on national and local. Um, and I, to the degree of, of, of how that, um, you know, plays out in, in your marketing will, will inherently, you know, shift what kind of angles and what kind of topics, keywords and, and phrases you're going for. I actually agree. Cause you, you mentioned, so you mentioned content marketing. And I think it's, it's, I think we're in a, we're in a, we're in a position these days where we think of SEO and we say, Hey, well, you know, how do we, we all know that we need to marry SEO with content marketing to some degree, right? Because that's actually how we're going to fuel our SEO efforts, right? Uh, there needs to be an underlying strategy with tying that into content marketing. And that could be looking top, top of the funnel to all the way down to the bottom, right? But how are we going to produce content that's going to complement our SEO strategy from top of the funnel to bottom? And then maybe the referral loop right back up, right? Absolutely. And yeah, the, uh, sorry, go on. Go ahead. It's a super interesting point in, in the sense that, you know, if you can create a content calendar quarterly or even monthly, right, you can do it even weekly. I mean, peaks, we do it weekly, right? But everyone, you don't always need to do it weekly. You can have your own cadence in terms of what's going to make sense for you, for you or, and your business. Um, you're so, you, you hit the nail on the head, right? Like so many people are thinking if we're, if we're making a recipe and SEO is a cake, right? Like, the content is is the substance, right? Mm-hmm. It's the layers and the the fluffy cake part, right? And then the optimization is the <clears> icing, <throat> right? So you can't just no one wants to eat a cake that's just pure icing, which is what we saw in the the twenty tens and twenty twelves, which is just like keywords and just stuffing keywords and like low impact, low quality content. It would get people to the site, and people's expectations may have been different back then, right? Right. But today we can smell that stuff a mile away. Right. And Google does too. And, and clearly, right. Like those types of articles aren't, aren't performing in the search anymore. So just to kind of double back on, on, you know, what we're reiterating about this content strategy. I mean, what, what I think can impact businesses the most is really having a solid game plan. And so if you, you're not fancy and you don't have all these tools and we'll list some of these tools out again, answer the public core.com SEM rush. Right. Um, what you can do is just start with the the five questions, like just digitize what's already being right. Digitize your in-person sales process and reinforce that, right? The whole goal of, of marketing, whether, you know, Neil's point, whether it's growth hacking or PPC or SEO or, you know, social media, it's, it's really that omni omni channel connection. So if someone comes in off social and then they Google a blog post and you're ranking for that blog post, like not only is that going to drive authority and relevancy, it's it's like, wow, I'm getting very, a lot of consistency out of this business, right? And the messaging is very clear and I can I can trust 
this brand more than I would, you know, just someone else at the top of Google, right? And so I think as you're you're developing your your plan, it's really important to to start with your top five questions, but then you can go a little bit deeper into that and really just put yourself in the eyes of the customer. Like, you know, I don't think I need to, to elaborate too much on that, but really thinking about like what are those fine details of the terms and the fine print that everyone's scanning for, right? And like. How can we help calm our users down and empower them and give them enough information to make an educated decision? And, and in doing so, um, you know, we need to be comprehensive, right? So um, doesn't mean you need to have a 3000 word piece of content on every single page, right? That's not practical for most businesses. But what is practical is you know, adding some FAQs to the bottom or structuring different series of content, right? And so like with S SEO, we talk a lot about, for example, content marketing. So what are those? five to 10 different areas that we could put a series out and then interlink those blogs. We can drive referral traffic. We can syndicate those blogs on, on social. And, um, you know, as people are reading, they can click through and read other articles and, and really get lost in that funnel and start to drink some of the Kool-Aid, so to speak, so that, um, they, they, you know, have this, this, uh, basically the goal is like, if you find water in a desert, you're going to go back when you're thirsty. Right. And so what we want is to is to position our brands as as these thought leaders and start to think about um, in what ways can we create a better experience, right? Google's whole um, whole mantra is let's create a great experience, and that's why it really starts with content, right? Is without content, you're you're not going to have it can be the best looking website in the world if the content doesn't resonate, you're going to have a high bounce rate. People aren't going to to stick around, right? Um, but then do we, how comprehensively do we cover that content? And so if we're positioning our brand against another brand in the industry, and again, let's say you don't have all the tools, let's say you, you do have the tool, which is Google itself, right? How do we do content gap analysis and see like, what are our competitors talking about? What are the, the core topics? Are we covering all of these? Do we offer any differentiation in how we service these clients or the, these businesses? And so. Um, you know, it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach of like looking at your competitors, looking at what's happening in the market on the first page of Google is a great starting point, right? Looking at Quora, which will, will help you understand more or less what people are searching for question wise within your market, right? Answer the public is, is kind of a search engine tool that will list the who, what, where, when, how of a, of a given topic to really give you another angle in terms of, of what people are searching for. And if you can build out a, a content roster of, you know, three to six months worth of content, have it all highly relevant. And then I would, I would say paramount to all that. The end goal is comprehensively covering the topic, right? So I don't know. I love dogs, right? So let's just take an example of like Siberian Huskies, right? Google's looking for what they call searcher task accomplishment of your website. So when it's analyzing your page, it's saying how likely is um, your page to satisfy a, a user's query, whether it's B2C, B2B, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, what it's looking at is how comprehensively are you covering this topic, right? And so if we're talking about Siberian Huskies, we should be talking about, you know, their lineage, um, the size of, you know, how big do they get? What are the different colors and, and coats and um, what are the different, you know, breeds of Huskies and, and really just thinking like, what are what is everything someone will want to know? Or if you're a sports fan, like Boston Bruins, right? Like, or, you know, uh, you know, soccer, whatever it is, right? Like, who are the star players? What's their stadium? Who's the coach? How many championships have they won? Or how many playoffs have they made? Things like that, right? Now, not everyone's going to want to read everything. So that's where, where, the, where it really starts to um, become more of a user experience type thing, where you want to optimize the right content in the right order and the right flow. And so in, in really mapping out your content strategy ahead of time, you can have a, a whether you're a more visual person, you just like a spreadsheet, right? You can really have this this comprehensive roster of like, okay, everything you need to know about X, and then oh wait, here's a, a sub series and more questions that people are going to have, or you know, as they're going through those different stages, right? And so you're going to find some discovery content, you're going to so find some transactional content, some commercial content, people just looking at the market, and what um, you know the best brands do is over time they're building this roster of supporting content. So, you know, back to that Siberian Husky example, if we're a website about Siberian Huskies and we're talking about every single blog topic mm -hmm. from how to care for your Husky to how to brush to, to what, you know, foods and medicines to avoid things like that, what Google is going to look at is they're going to look at your site and say, okay, these guys are, clearly want to rank for Siberian Huskies. 
let's take a look at their blogs. Let's take a look at some of what we call supporting content, right? And they're going to say, wow, these guys have, have comprehensively covered this topic in detail, in depth, right? Which is automatically going to place you at a greater advantage. You know, SEO right. has so many moving parts, backlinks, on page. The content should be your core foundation. I, I agree, actually, because so going back to what you mentioned with all the research, right? That's where it always starts. And I don't think a lot of businesses tend to, they tend to like dive straight in. It's like, let's go and optimize for this keyword and, and that sort of thing. And I think one point I really want to make is we know that the first step of actually building this strategic plan to guide, you know, to guide you to actually getting like the highest ROI is to understand your current market position. That's like phase one, right? And there's a lot of questions you should be asking. One thing I always throw out there when I'm doing an audit or when I'm helping a client, you know, just understand what their current position is to find out, hey, what do we need to prioritize for this plan? We Do we have lots of brand recognition or do we have none? If we have lots, then maybe we need to start with building lower, uh, you know, lower funnel content. So bottom of the funnel content, because you're looking at converting the already existing, tra you know, the already existing traffic that's coming in. Whereas if you know that you're not getting any traffic, really like zilch then you know you want to go after the top of the funnel uh content and then see how you can drive them to being educated enough to learn more about hey well how do we get them to make maybe download something how do we get them to interact with us middle of the funnel and understand what we actually provide moving towards you know the bottom of the funnel of course and i don't think a lot of people actually ask about that so Actually, saying this, because we were talking about the technical aspects of it, right? Um, and moving on from, we know that the first phase is obviously understanding that current market position. So David has kindly put, you know, that it's important to do the upfront research and to understand the connections between each topic and the number of questions you can ask just based on that one topic, right? And what's great about SEO is that there's a ton of topics that there might be limited number of topics for certain companies, but there's there's still going to be quite a few topics in which you can always come up with a new question, a new answer, um, just simply because the market's going to be moving, right? The market just doesn't stay the same, right? It always evolves. And so I want to go into like, how important is it to like get SEO right for technical industries, right? So from the get go, right? So I understand you serve the medical and finance verticals and you mentioned, you know, how that would how SEO would differ between the two because you could have a fusion between B2C and B2B like approaches. But like, where do you start with low hanging fruits, right? How would you, we know we want to assess the current situation. So I guess what's important to get right from the get go. I think that's important that we touch on that sort of subject because a lot of people will probably skip past that, right? What's important to get, get done now or at the very beginning versus later when we actually have something. Do you think it's something like, meeting intent or do you think it's something like just serving content right that's a fantastic question so um in terms of content there is a technical component right and so in 20 i think it was 2013 there's this big panda algorithm update yep. right that took a lot of sites down uh, that you know almost everyone in the seo industry is is very aware of um one of the main things that panda uh, you know that that resulted out of panda were were, were some recommendations from Google. And it was almost like 23 questions mm -hmm. from Panda that you can that you can apply to your website. So one of the questions, it's these are like questions that Google would ask the website owner would be like, does your site produce overlapping redundant or like articles that you're just kind of putting out for keywords, right? Like where you might talk about one topic in three different articles, when really those could be one article. And so that's one technical consideration when you're thinking, you know, we'll, we'll shift away from the content here in just a sec. But that is one thing that can really shoot yourself in the foot. It's like, let's just create content. We need to create content. Sometimes it's better to create a, a, a one comprehensive article than it is to create three similar, smaller articles. Now there are points where you want to create smaller, more bite-sized content, but you want to be siloed for certain keywords. You don't want a lot of overlap or what they call content cannibalization. What can happen with that content cannibalization if you're, let's say, um, you know, you're putting out like the seven reasons to use, you know, our SAAS product. And then you're like, best reasons to use the SAAS product, right? They're like very similar. They're probably talking about the same things, maybe done in a, a slightly different way contextually, but it's, it's more or less the same article. So that's one major thing to avoid. Now, you know, for, for those that don't have that problem, not a big deal. But one thing you can do is audit if you already have content, like, 
Are there articles we can combine? Are there articles that are performing better? Maybe one is performing really well and one is not. How can we combine and, and kind of merge the, the, the information from the article that, that isn't doing as good into the new article and provide even more value? So those are some, some technical strategies that are also creative. Like you need creatives to help you with these things because mm -hmm. it's easy to say combine this article. But it's like, well, how do we make this art <laughs> merge these two pieces of artwork, right? And it can get a little more tricky. In terms of low-hanging fruit for, um, for SaaS businesses, uh, software businesses, I mean, one of the most important things in today's world is speed, right? And so site speed is a huge determining factor in how well you're going to rank in search and how well you're going to convert. And so w one thing that, that um, we like to look at in, in the early, early, early stages of a campaign, even before we, we engage with someone, is how fast is site speed? And so if your mobile speed is is low, and one way that you can test this is you can Google, go to Google and type Google page speed and do an analysis. Um, there's another one called Lighthouse 3.0, which is more or less how that, that you know, mm -hmm. Google scans your site and creates this score. Um, the Cloudflare did a study and they said, well, you know, sites that load in, you know, six to seven seconds versus, you know, under four seconds, there's like a 50 to 100% either whatever way you want to see in a negative way, it'd be a drop off or in a positive way, it'd be an increase. Like you could increase your conversion rate by 50 or hundred percent just by reducing that, um, that time to, to, you know, first buy it or the time that a user gets to see uh, a piece of content. And so you know, it used to be right. We, we we're used to slower internet. Now it's like with 5g, everyone expects things to be quick and things that are quick are good, right? They're fast. They're, they're reliable. Right. And so when something is slow, that's already giving someone a perception of your brand, right? So if you're this this amazing SaaS company and you're like, hey, we're going to be able to to you know automate X Y Z, or you're going to have this this great seamless experience, but then your site takes eight seconds to load or five seconds to load, it's like, well, how quick? You know, their users are already making judgments about your brand and the quality of your brand, right? And so the converse is true, right? If we can speed up that website. When a user hits your brand, they're going to be like, wow, this brand is fast. They're, it's clean. It's authoritative. It's, it's instant. This is probably what my experience in working with this brand is going to be like, or this is probably going to be the experience that I have in engaging with this product or service. Um, there's a, a certain level of trust factor there. And what we end up actually seeing is the bounce rate is reduced. Um, we see more time spent on the page, right? And we also see a higher conversion rate. Um, and lastly, we see more traffic from Google, but let's discount Google for right now. Like, let's say you're doing paid ads, you're doing Google, you're doing email, you're doing Facebook, you know, direct people are coming to you directly from handing out business cards, whatever it is, conferences, right? You could increase your conversion rate across mm -hmm. all of those channels. So there's a nice exponential jump. Um, it's a low hanging fruit now that it is more technical, right? Depending on what you're hosting a website on, what platform you're on. If you're on a Magento versus a WordPress or a Webflow, or depending on what platform you're using, there's a you know certain level of optimization that that will inherently be be possible with that platform. So if you're like on a Wix, which probably no one is, but this is just an example, right? You're not going to be able to really optimize anything. But if you're on a Drupal or Magento or WordPress or something that that you can actually edit the code on, right? Now we're talking, and so. The, the goal in, in this page speed optimization is to prioritize your above the fold content so that you want everything to render and a user to see something as quickly as possible. And in doing so, that's, you know, have you, have you guys ever been on a website and it's like spinning, spinning, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna hit the back button and hit the next result, right? So um, not a super complex thing to talk about in terms of, of why you need it, but in terms of, of how to do it, it does require, um, you know, full stack in most cases to go in and, and optimize the server, optimize the loading order of the theme, optimizing images. You know, if you don't, if you're not at that level where you're like, hey, I, I'm ready to go and, and, and revamp and clean up my entire website, the first thing that you can start with would be images, right? And so a lot of times, absolutely, um, whether you're big or small, right, people are uploading, you know, 700, one megabyte, you know, 700 kilobyte, a megabyte, two megabytes sometimes, right? If we just pick up our phone and take a picture, it's like a four megabyte image. So we really want to make sure that we're serving losslessly compressed images. And that's a fancy word for like reducing the size of the image, right? And you can use a tool called tiny PNG yeah. or there's multiple tools um, that can help you, you know, optimize around that. But that's, that's a big one that a lot of companies miss. And I, I usually compare, so this is, it's going to be a weird analogy, but I usually, I usually compare SEO, like technical optimization to cold calling, right? When you're cold calling someone, 
you want to make sure you get you get to the point they've got they already have like they're low on time right so if you imagine that that same person you're trying to cold call imagine if, if they were actually scrolling through a website or they were just doing having a quick search and they want to look for a, some a piece of information if you're not giving it to them if you're not providing that value so far up front so like directly so quickly they're gonna hang up right they're gonna go so that's i think i've always i've always compared it to it's almost similar to cold calling the reason why you want to focus on the website as optimization and actually having a website a, a good enough website to actually start seo with the countless number of times i've suggested an seo strategy or i've been I've suggested a strategy and they want to do SEO, but I said, well, you don't have the resource to do it and you don't want to push time on to creating a website. Well, it's because, you know, that's, you don't have a website Like you, you need, you need the foundation, you need the marketing infrastructure to put in place to run SEO. And so these, these technical changes are really important. They might seem small when we actually talk about it, but actually the underlying impact on the psychology of every user is, is, is great, right? They, they want, we're in a we're in an age where information you want it very quickly right? we're able to get it straight away so if you're not giving them what they can get elsewhere then they're going to go elsewhere and similar to cold calling you want to make sure you're essentially using your head like spending time on those headlines on those early descriptions above the fold you know generating credibility showcasing exactly what you do telling them exactly what you're going to offer and why it's important to them before they bounce uh, or before they leave and the one way to do that is to load all that information as fast as possible right when they get there um which reminds me like you mentioned the kpi right of looking at technical of the sp of paid speed right and a lot of people don't you though think about that, that the kpi should match up to what you're trying to improve so what your strategy is actually trying to say so if we're going back to what we said about understanding your current marketing current market position if you know you need to build out your seo strategy and we know we're doing a current uh, we're doing our current audit and we're trying to assess our current situation. You need to be asking yourself these questions, right? Um, is it, you know, what, why aren't you getting tofu traffic, for example? Why aren't you getting so top of the funnel traffic? Is it traffic that's the issue here? Am I getting traffic or am I getting traffic and there's no leads? There's no one actually interacting. There's no clicks on anywhere on these pages where I've actually introduced some um, really valuable elements and people aren't just taking any action. Or is it that we're focusing on, hey, well, we're testing this page and there's no bottom of the funnel conversions, right? Maybe we want to improve that. So the same way we want to look at metrics for each part of the funnel, each each action, you need to be assigning, looking at the right KPI for paid, like something like page speed, right? So if we're talking about bounce rate, you know that, or dwell time, we know that it's highly associated with, with your page speed, with your load times, with your uh, time to first content, right? Or time to first click or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. So... It's. I think it's really important to get that that KPI aspect like down to a T when and looking at looking at it in an ISO, in its own environment. So hey, we're trying to focus on keeping people on the page. Well, let's look at where people are bouncing. Let's maybe install some heat maps, like using something free like Hotjar. Now we have Microsoft Clarity, which produces some uh, some cool data for a website now. And um, you're able to actually assess, hey, well, how are people scrolling? Where's the hotspots? Do I need to add a button here? Because it seems like people are clicking here. Or do I need to remove some stuff, right? Do I need to push my uh, my who I work with like above the fold, so further up the fold so that we can show pe showcase to people we're quite credible, we're quite reputable, and we're quite authoritative. And that kind of brings me to aligning, so what we said about the, the key topic, right? The key talking point of this conversation to build that strategic plan. You know, how do we align, the next phase will be to how do we align the data and our with our goals, right? So that we're successful with SEO. How do we actually make sure that it's scalable, right? And I think one of the, one of the best questions I always ask is uh, to any marketer out there is, you know, is there a best practice to when assigning a KPI to SEO, right? So how should, do you have any best practices as to when you're thinking about building that SEO plan, how you should be thinking about those KPIs? That's a, that's a really interesting question. So I, I tend to reverse engineer, you know, there's a book in business that, that basically said, well, how do you, how do you plan you know, as a growing company, right? There's all these things that you want, and um, you know, cash flow is is going to be increasing, but you might not always have the ability to to move in real time. So, how do we kind of prioritize? Right. And and what 
well, actually my mentor told me it was like, start in reverse. So it's like, do you want, um, it'd be like, how much are you going to pay your employees? How much are you going to pay yourself? Where like reverse engineer your budget and then find the way to go and create that. So there's, that's one strategy is, is, is like, where do we need to be from a customer acquisition standpoint, a CPA st standpoint, right? Like it's easy. It's more of a finance question, right? Of, uh, in terms of numbers and margins and things like that. Uh, but you may not be starting there, especially if you're starting from square one, right? Like those are going to be, those are going to improve over time, but you may not be starting in the, in the acceptable range that you, you want to be at, you know, three to six a year from now. Right. So one thing that I, that I like to, um, you know, the first kind of KPIs that I, that I look at are, you know, sites that we see that do really well have typically over two minutes of dwell time, right? Two to three minutes, um, tend to have a lower bounce rate and also tend to have obviously the faster page speed and pages per session. Those are like the core ones outside of conversions. And, and ultimately, if you don't have, you know, your conversion tracking set, that's number one, right? Um, from there, you know, looking at um, how we we basically set these baselines of like we want to have an average of you know about two minutes on every page or above. Um, you know, we want to shoot for. You can look at the conversion rate of of most websites and and create kind of a baseline metric of like what what's an acceptable range, um, and then we're measuring against that, right? And so you can now to to your point, right? Like maybe you're above the fold content. Um, you know, b being such a big determining factor. Right, that might be one of those areas that you're you're optimizing and playing with to to get the numbers into spec, right? And so if you see, you're like, wow, we had this really great page, we launched it, it's only getting, you know, a 50 second dwell time mm. and um, an 80 percent bounce rate. It's like, well, what do we do now? Um, I love Google Optimize, so it's it's really cool to be able to split test different pages and split test changes in real time without having to manually go and like tally up the hits, right? And, and so you can do it in a, in a very controlled experimental way um, that will yield actual results in sometimes as little as two weeks, depending on how much traffic your site gets, right? So the goal is to get a large enough sample size to your point that, you know, you can actually make some educated decisions on. But the cool thing about Google Optimize is, you know, if you had that page with a 50 second dwell time and a, you know, 80% bounce rate, how do we optimize that above the fold content? How do we get people to stay on that page a little bit longer and, and know which levers to pull? And so to your point, that could be as easy as adding buttons and calls to action, but truly like where we start is, is this um, baseline of metrics, knowing what, you know, historically seeing so many analytics accounts and seeing that, you know, people who are in that conversion spot are typically on the site for longer than three minutes. And then people that are bouncing or, or not converting are typically on, you know, under a minute on the site, higher bounce rate, less pages per session. So the whole goal is to continue to refine that data and, and work in this um, work in this process that continues to feed the data back in. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what what you can do is, you know, whether it's a content person, design person, right, some changes are, are content related, some are design related. It might be of great content and a and a poor design. Anyone who does Facebook marketing knows this, right? You can have a great piece of, of ad copy and a bad piece of creative, and it's not going to go and vice versa. So you know, the first first point is is looking at like your intro paragraphs and your headings and making sure that that resonates. Looking at other pages, right? And making sure that that maybe you're, you're reflecting some of the same positioning or messaging from pages that are keeping users on the on the site for a little bit longer. And so um, in in turn, it's it's really just having this this process of looking at your analytics data, launching a page, and not just like setting it and forgetting it, right? It's like let's launch the page, and it's almost like in sales, like the sales never done, the the SEO is never done, right? Until you get it to a point where it sticks, and you know at some point you're going to want to keep updating it and keep it relevant. Um, but truly, it's it's looking at the data in real time and saying, okay, we improved our page speed. How did that in affect our bounce rate? Okay, it improved it, but there's still some pages that have a high bounce rate. Okay, well, well, let's eliminate that. You know, it's deductive reasoning. Okay, this is no longer page speed's good. It's not a page speed issue. It's either a design issue or content issue. Mm -hmm. Let's make one to two changes. And I like to do bigger changes. I think that that just like changing the color of a button is great, but that's like after you've kind of figured everything out and you're just trying to squeeze the last little bit out of the campaign, right? It should start with like big things like calls to action, imagery, colors. Uh, is your site light and bright or is it dark? And like, depending on what your brand is, you, you know, if you're more pre prestigious brand, you might want black and white and, and really dark and edgy and cool, right? 
Uh, you may have a page that you know has great content it just doesn't captivate the user visually it's not visually explaining the content in a way that the user can scan through it which is going to lead to a high bounce rate and so um you know in short the the kpis that that you know most marketers are looking at and, and especially seos right are your bounce rate your um pages per session uh time spent on page obviously conversion rate mm-hmm. And then there's some other things that you can do, like in Google Search Console, and look at things like click-through rate um, and, and how to get people more people into that funnel, right? Um, but the the goal, and, and to your point, Neil, is, is paramount is like we want to keep them there, right? Like it doesn't do us any good to add, you know, I, I almost compare it to an orange, right? Like if you have an orange and you're squeezing juice out of it and you got 100 people to visit, but you only got one person to convert, it's just like squeezing like one little drop of juice. And so, so many people... Uh, to your point, right? They're concerned with how do we get more people in the funnel? How do we get people more top of the funnel? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and really, you know, depending on what season of business you're in and depending on, on how much traffic your website gets, right. It should almost be the reverse. It should be like, how do we keep people in this funnel? And if I can't keep a direct user in this funnel, how am I going to keep an SEO person on this funnel or a referral person in this funnel? So um, you can start these things now so that and in doing so, that's actually going to create a greater affinity with the users that visit your site. Um, there's a lot of speculation that Google uses these kind of KPIs as indicators for whether someone enjoys the the website or not, right? And so with with Google, they're trying to provide the best user experience possible. So if they see a user click on a page and hit the back button, they're basically inferring that that user didn't have a great experience, right? But if a user went through, spent time, clicked on links that were presented to them, you know, maybe opted into an email list or call to action, had some kind of conversion element. Right now, let's try to send a little bit more traffic. And and it's almost like plateaus. It's like you have to kind of graduate. It's like school, right? Like, absolutely. you know, you start at grade one and then you move to grade two and you move to grade three. And so, um, you know, this is, uh, I'm so glad you asked this question because this really kind of brings it full circle, which is like, well, how am I graduating from grade one to grade two to grade five to, right? And it's, it's really the process of, of knowing which levers to pull, knowing what KPIs to look for, and then determining, you know, with either testing or, or you know, very consistent uh, controls, right? Not just like, oh, I tried this and looks like it worked, right? It's like, no, let's put in Google Optimize. Let's use Google Analytics. Let's set a goal so we can measure that difference in conversion rate. We had a client where uh, their opt-in page had about a 2% conversion rate, wow. right? which to me was, a, was pretty good. Um, but then we looked at a Google optimized split test and just putting one of their reps pictures on the, like next to the contact form and some reviews below that contact form and like edifying themselves while giving someone the opportunity to scroll more. And like, you don't have to opt in having kind of two opt-ins at the top and bottom mm-hmm. and social proof in between took it to a 7%. And it was like, I would have never guessed that it would have tripled the conversion rate, but it was consistent, like super consistent. And we we're like, wow. Um, we need to be doing this on every page of their website now, right? How can we take the same, same principle? And maybe it doesn't work in every single context, but there are definitely other places that we can start rolling this out. And so um, just back to that squeezing the, the orange analogy, right now we're, we're getting quarter cup of juice, right? Instead of just a few drops. And so the more users you add and the more, you know, you almost want to be adding more leads and increasing the conversion rate at the same time yep. to get that, that exponential effect. Yeah, with with a hurdle analogy, if we look if we look at that as well, you need to select KPIs that would actually go ahead and say, hey, well, based on based on the number of hurdles I've set up, these KPIs are going to tell me the ultimate story of how my user is going to get onto my page, how they're going to go through my page, and then how they're going to convert. Right. Um, so I think it's really really important that KPIs do tell a story. And I think there's one controversial question. I guess I want to really ask you because a lot of SEOs do do ask this question, and it's about bounce rate and it being a north star metric, right? Um, <laughs> It's, you know, bounce rates obviously thrown around quite a bit and people t- team to ignore something like exit, exit, uh, like exit percentage or exit rate, whatever. But they don't think about uh, the fact of what bounce rate actually means. You know, nowadays, if you think about what Google's goal is, right, or, or any other, any search engine, it's to actually make sure that ensure that all the users that use those search engines, for example, are able to meet or get the information they re- they need, right? So Google is constantly testing in the background how whether particular websites work well with particular audiences. So they're doing their own tests. So if you imagine they're taking, they're actually doing their own tests, you're not, you're going to get a certain, I guess, 
a stream of visitors to your site, right? And not all of those visitors are always going to be perfect for your site. So it's okay to look at the bounce rate and be like, hey, I know that this this average bounce rate is totally safe for us. And we know that the rest of us are relevant. They're relevant users. And just looking at something like that, it's important to connect bounce rate to something like looking at your demographics data. So you can understand, hey, well, based on our recent changes with uh, or recent publishing of content and uh, any optimizations we've made, have we attracted a demographic that doesn't fit our target audience or our buyer personas or our avatars, whichever we want to call it? Or is it, are they accurate? And we do know that, hey, our bounce rate is actually related to maybe Google feeding in some relatable terms that have been picked up because we've been producing content around this, right? And it's okay. Like, I think people look at it as, oh, no, we definitely need to make a change when we don't actually need to make a change. So what are your thoughts on that, David, in terms of just looking at bounce rate in isolation? I think that's a, an, a huge important distinction, and it can become a vanity metric, right? It can be like you're going down the rabbit hole on something that doesn't necessarily need to happen. So um, I love your point about matching up the data and, and maybe looking at Google Search Console, like did we add a piece of content or a keyword that is, for whatever reason, right, Google is maybe testing a different demographic or a different keyword or a different niche mm -hmm. that it assumes is is correlated to to your brand. Maybe you just have a, a really great piece of content. It's ranking for something that that is kind of off the beaten path. Um, the other thing to consider is is, you know, some pages will inherently have a high bounce rate. So some of your discovery blogs and traffic, right? A user is looking for an answer to something. And so it's common in some cases when you have really successful blogs um, that are generating a lot of traffic or, you know, generating consistent traffic to see a higher bounce rate or exit rate on those pages. It's like you did a great job. People found what they wanted. Um, it can take people up to seven times to actually take action with your brand. So this might have just been the first introduction to your brand. And arguably, you might want to retarget that person on, you know, paid ads or something just to kind of keep them in, keep them at top of mind awareness. Um, I think that's a huge, huge distinction. You definitely don't want to get in the weeds on the bounce rate. There's a lot of people that use it as like the end all be all. I think the heat map would, would be more um, telltale of like what's actually happening on the page and whether the user's having a, a, an unpleasant experience or whether they, they actually found what they needed. You solved with their query. Maybe they're not ready to buy yet. Maybe they're at a point where they're just looking for the answer to the question. Inherently, we're going to bounce no matter what. Absolutely. And 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 it's important to, I guess it's important for us to cover this sort of detail. And it's like, how often do you think that KPIs should be assessed? So, so yeah, how should KPIs be assessed and how often? We've covered how they should be assessed, right? By understanding exactly what's part of our strategy and actually zeroing uh, in on those particular KPIs that tell you, hey, this segment is what I want to focus on. So keeping people on the page opposed to, so keeping the traffic that's just hit our page on our actual website, right? Rather than um, them leaving straight away because they're unable, let's say the page didn't load well enough or they weren't able to get the information. Maybe we're targeting the wrong keywords or maybe it's associated with another topic these days. So how often, I guess, David, do you would you recommend that people should be assessing their KPIs? I would say, you know, conservatively, you're looking at a month. Like I have, um, it's kind of like the stock market. You can look at it every day. It's going to go up and down, up and down. But over a month, you should be able to identify like a clear indicator trend, right? That you can take some action on. Now, there is an argument that says, you know, you should be checking it if not every day, like every week, like was traffic up or down this week so that there are indicators, like maybe someone in the company decided to change a URL based on the fact that management wanted a different URL mm -hmm. or, right, there can be things that can be detrimental that, that inherently you want some indicators on to see if something broke, right? Or if something changed in Google's algorithm or if something changed on the website, maybe you did this new hero image and traffic dropped like, 50% on the homepage are like, whoa, what happened here? Did I upload an unoptimized image? Was it the text? Was it the... So I think as a, as a general rule of thumb, you know, we're looking at things on a weekly basis, but you're looking at it over the trend of a month. And you're, the goal is to not get to an end of the month and like not know what happened, right? And have to make decisions at the end of the month. It's, it's really like this kind of gradual observation and effort and tweaking and refining and making sure that the the plan from yesterday still needs to be the plan today and and continuing in that direction or conversely making sure that you know what we enacted yesterday didn't isn't going to hurt us tomorrow based on a, a split change or a test or an inadvertent change on the website that someone maybe 
who writes the content didn't realize that changing a permalink would totally destroy the SEO for the page, right? And there needs to be a redirect there. Things like that happen, right? Especially when you've, you've got a lot of moving parts or you've got a growing business, right? Like you're focused on running that business. You're not always focused on the exact implementation of a change on the website, right? And so I think having that that awareness, you know, around what's happening on a weekly basis, you can even have Google send you an automated report of like, here's your top performing pages. Here's kind of what... Um, we saw, you know, was traffic up or down? Was this segment up or down? And you can really see if, if things are consistent. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of the month, right, you should be able to um, measure against what had been done the previous month. And right, SEO is kind of like the, the thing that you do today is going to impact you one, two, three months from now. So you want to be able to pick that up over time and start to see, okay, what were my top pieces of content this month? And did we um, improve, you know, our bounce rate and KPIs? And I want to talk too much about bounce rate, right? But did our page speed improve? Did our user metrics improve? Did our conversions improve? And so um, that is one of the, the mo more important, I think, ways to approach it is like, it can be every day if you want it to be. I think that's, that's maybe too many samples for most teams. Um, every month is great, but in some cases that can be too, like, infrequent if there is... A problem or you want to have you should be having eyes on your campaigns right throughout the the weeks and and that weekly like kind of status check-in update like let's see how, how our rankings are doing let's see how our traffic's doing maybe have like a an alert set up if we see a big drop in a page something like that that's really going to to keep your your eyes on the prize and be able to to still execute but if something does change you know you'll catch it before um you know whether it's good or bad like it could be a really great thing like oh my god we did this blog and this just absolutely this blog took off and like it doesn't have a call to action at the bottom like let's get a call to action see if we can boost this conversion rate up exactly. so maybe things that 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 yield different types of you know that weren't different types of analysis the, the point is to know your numbers and to know them uh, on a basis that doesn't you know inundate the company with too much information obviously more data is better but you really want the information behind it not just the raw data so um, usually in a, a weekly or bi-weekly or monthly is is, is suffice depending on, on how aggressive and, and the size of your business. Yeah, I'd agree because, um, and and this moves us on to like, how, you know, why should objectives and KPIs be like timely, right? Um, so we technically cover just detail for that as well. But in in its own way, you know that with any KPIs you set, there's data, the amount of data you have is important, right? So with anything digital marketing related or just marketing related overall, if you're going to look at something every day and you say, let's get, I, on average, I got about five to six impressions a day or something, and then maybe two or three clicks a day. It's not enough data for me to go ahead and make tweaks straight away, right? So we need to abide by this thing called statistical significance, right? You need enough data to actually believe it, to say, hey, I actually truly believe that the tweak I just made, or I can make a tweak here because it's been about a month and we know that over a thousand visitors have come by so far. We know that um, out of those thousand people, maybe five people have converted, right? Or something. And we want to just be able to increase that conversion rate, for example, on a particular page, if that's a lower down, um, a lower down the funnel, bottom of the funnel page, right? So it's important that timely is sort of coupled with, hey, well, do I have enough data? And I think that's where you can justify whether that KPI is timely. I'm looking at it at a certain amount of time because it may also differ by channel. So for a higher, you know that at the top of the funnel page, we're saying we we know that this is our traffic driving page, right? That's going to have way more data compared to a bottom of the funnel page where there's less traffic. So you want to make sure you wait enough, uh, wait for long enough to gather enough data and then make a decision. Otherwise, we're making tweaks and we just don't know what works. And in the end, it's going to be guesswork, which is the worst thing you can do as a marketer. That is probably the most important point of this call. <laughs> <laughs> or shouldn't say call, but podcast. Yeah. Um, right. So much it's uh, people just start going to action bias mode and like, let's just start. Change. And then next thing you know, you don't know what you did and what worked and what didn't guesswork. Right. So yeah, absolutely. Um, such a big point. And I think this brings me to like, my final part, right? My final question, because in in growth marketing or marketing overall, right? Or actually, let's say with growth, growth marketing specifically, we fo we tends to be a little different in the sense that we try to focus on uh, it's it's a little bit more aggressive in the sense that you're you're more on the testing side um, because you just don't know what works and you've recommended a strategy and uh, a couple of strategies. 
and data is really important. So I guess, David, what would be your suggestions if budgets are thin and you need to start with SEO, right? Like what would you recommend? It's quite a, quite a broad question, but even if you have some insight into, you know, what you would do with a thin budget, right? I would create some short term. So, so very similar to like the, the business budgeting, right? Like create some short term attainable goals. Like it doesn't have to be goals that it's like, I want to be on the first page tomorrow. That's probably like an unrealistic and a little, right. That's, that's a kind of funny example, but like start with, but it's true. Um, a lot of people do think it like is that. true. <laughs> a lot of people think it's like, Oh, well, if I could just do this and it's possible, like you create a really great article that fills a, a, a hole in a niche that doesn't have a, a great piece of content around that's possible. Right. But it's probably uh, an expectation saved for, for another season of business. Right. And so, um, I like to set short term attainable goals of like, how can we, you know, if we have this budget, what is the best way to, to, to use this budget mm -hmm. and what are, what's going to create an impact across um, multiple facets of my marketing. Ideally, right, we're just talking about SEO, but kind of like that page speed piece of advice, right? That could apply to every user that's coming to your site. So that's one of those those really big kind of like overlapping. So I'm looking for overlap, right? Um, I think content, foundation, you know, page speed, those are super important. We covered those in, in pretty great detail. And we can also, you know, you can also leverage some of that content for paid campaigns or for, you know, some of your other marketing channels, but truly like if you can sit down and align, okay, here's my budget, here are the levers that I can pull, whether if it's not development, if it's not page speed, it, it could be content. If it's not content, it might be design. If it's not design, right, it might be, you know, the theme of the website or, or the platform that you're using that can help you scale things out. And so um, SEO is about seven core areas, right? There's reputation management, there's backlinking, there's on page, um, there's content, right? There's technical SEO and like page speed and like site crawling, things like that. And so typically what I start with is like, get all of your, your ducks in a row that you can that are free. Like, so if you can get some free backlinks from, you know, Quora, um, Facebook, I mean, like obviously all the social channels provide backlinks, right? You can sign up for a medium account, might not be a follow backlink. It's still going to be a backlink, still going to drive some relevancy, right? Like see what you can do. Um, like where do your skills like really, where's your team skill set or your skill set primarily focused? Cause there's about seven areas, right? So if we can only focus on four, that's still four great areas that we can improve on. And over time, as we see results and, you know, ROI and, and can start scaling these campaigns up. Now we can, now we can take a, a look at some of the more aggressive backlinking and the things that are tend to be heavier lifting for people. But just to kind of refine this down, like I would look at your reputation, do you have Google reviews? Do you, is when someone searches your brand and reviews, you've got to have that, right? And that goes into Google's algorithm. So if you don't have great reviews, you're already starting like behind the starting mm -hmm. point, right? Um, same thing with your page speed, right? Like that's something that's going to impact um, actually multiple channels. The third thing that I would look at are, um, you know, what are the content opportunities that I really want to go for? What are the non-negotiables and what are the things that are, are like nice to have later on? Starting with those five questions or the five kind of core buckets of, 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 you know, hot spots and, and hot buttons for people that, you know, they're, they're already asking, or, you know, if you're brand new in the market, right? Like going on core, answer the public, seeing what the market sentiment is around these products and services and how we can, um, help ease the customer and, uh, and position them as, as, a uh, you know, someone who's making an educated decision, not someone who might be, you know, overlooking something. Agreed. Um, and, and to your point with the website, right? Like the website is really where it all starts. So if, if, you know, if you had one thing to spend your money on, it'd probably be the website first website and content, making sure that that website, you know, has a best in class experience, right? Like when you compare it to similar brands or, or similar, you know, other competitors in your industry, like, is it going to match up? Is it going to stand out? Like we want to be different than everyone. We also want to want to have some level of familiarity. So it's not, you know, it's not like a, a foreign concept when someone visits our site at the same time. So, um, you know, while a lot of these are content related, the, the technical is really where I see the most mistakes being made. And so, um, you know, looking for things like broken links, like these tend to be issues that are for people who've already have a website and have, have been using that website for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Um, where like, maybe they have really old blog posts that have thin content. Like these are free things that we can do, right? We don't have to go and, and vet backlinks and pay for outreach and do all these things right away. Let's start with 
really tidying up and doing some, whether it's fall cleaning or spring cleaning, right? Like let's get everything into a, a clean bill of health. We know that every link on the site works. We know that every contact form and button and it looks great on mobile and it looks even great on my grandma's iPhone six. Like no matter what, you know, what device you can use. I think there's a, a website called browser stack yep. where you can test, right? And um, broken link check to check for broken links on your site and just making sure that, you know, if Google's thing is quality and experience, like making sure that there's nothing that can jeopardize that is, is usually like a good starting point. And I'd say about 90% of businesses have some level of broken link, redirect, um, thin content. Why, why would thin content matter? You might ask, like maybe it's, it's, you've got eight pages of really high quality supporting and, and, and main content. And then you have this like press release from like four years ago that talked about how you, you know, hired a new like staff accountant or something. Right. And, and that really just didn't, it's not going to help you rank for anything. Or it was like an announcement for, you know, maybe a part of the software that was like, you know, no longer really like needs to be important, right? It's like not something people are going to look at anymore. So, um, you know, if you have like a, a paragraph or two of content on a blog, like I think of it as Google's looking at your whole site and it's giving you a grade and they're like, okay, well, how is your speed? How is the speed of every page? Okay, it's an A, great. You guys worked on your speed, great work. How's the content? Oh, content's looking good, right? We've got 10 pages with really good content, but then we have these like three older, like, I don't know what they were, either blog posts or just thin content. And those are like Fs. Like we don't see any value in this. Like they're just super low content. So instead of you having that A like aggregate score, you're going from like an A to like a C just because of those three pages. You're, the rest of your content's fantastic, right? So that's one of the the core things I would do is just audit where you're at, plan out your next series of content if, if you're ready for that. And if you're looking through an existing website, make sure that all your ducks in a row, like make sure that, that the site is free, for, free of errors. Make sure that every piece of content on the site contributes to a user experience that you would want for, you know, your spouse or your, your, your clients or whoever it is, right? Like put yourself in, in the person's shoes. And if you see things that are confusing or right, if the flow of the page is, is out of whack and you're, you're doing a hard sell at the top when they really just need to be, you know, informed and educated, like these are things that, that inherently by, by being aware, it's kind of like accounting, like, SEO is not rocket science. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of, of amazing work that, that we do as SEOs and it's, it can be a challenging industry and I don't want to want to minimize our, our importance and work in this industry. On the other end, um, you know, people, you don't have to be an SEO expert to, to necessarily, um, succeed, right? You just need to be focused on the right things and, and to, to the effect of bookkeeping, like you need to know your numbers, right? It doesn't mean you need to reconcile every account and know, every single, you know, plus and minus, but you need to know at the end of the day, like what's the brass tax and what's working and what's not. And so if you, you're taking that approach and, and you're eating the elephant piece by piece, um, you'll really have some, some targeted, you know, you'll come back w either with to yourself or with your team or, or whoever, go to your, to your web developer and be like, wow, these are the areas that we need to work on. And, and it'll show itself in the data. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just going to add and weigh in there and say that I'm totally convinced as well, going back to uh, the content as or the page aspect on having thin pieces of content that Google weighs out, you know, the overall good pages versus bad pages for each site. And then so if you have an overall good number of pages that are valuable, they'll treat you as a wholly valuable site. And um, I'm just saying that because in the past, when we've actually conducted, you know, tests of, hey, let's just remove these pages, you end up finding that... You, Google's almost being more active on your site, right? They're pushing more of your content, right? Because they know that you're, you've got rid of anything that provides a bad experience. So it's good, it's good to get, it's okay to get rid of those Fs. It doesn't mean you're going to lose like a ton of traffic or anything and probably to get in low traffic, right? So you know that there's a lot of stuff you could actually look at. And I think it really goes back down to David, what you said and to like sort of finalize here is that it will comes down to what you need to prioritize in the beginning, right? So this strategic SEO roadmap, it's you're going to be successful so long you focus on what you find out at the very beginning, what you're lacking and where you need to troubleshoot and using those KPIs to troubleshoot along the way so that, you know, you're staying true to your goal and you're really looking at the objective. And at, by as the months go by, let's say you're working on this for three quarters, then, you know, by the end of the third quarter, you should have had X, uh, X amount of improvement, right? Based on where you started off. And I think just trying not to get sort of, I guess they say analysis paralysis, like 
actually looking at multiple KD, KPIs and and actually trying to focus on multiple objectives, that's not that's not what's going to make you successful. It's going to be, you're going to be successful when you take things in a very systematic with a systematic approach, and you know that hey, well, if we're lacking here, we can prioritize these particular initiatives and using the KPIs to get there. So, I mean, I don't have, you know. Th- that this has been amazing, David. Uh, we've I feel like we've covered a lot. And to be fair, we could be talk, we could SEO is massive, right? We could be talking about SEO for like months or years and and on, right? So, um, so it's 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 a really big area, and you know it's been it's been amazing like having you here because I feel like we've definitely covered a few questions that or quite a few questions that actually people are going to be asking right themselves when they're setting up this roadmap. So yeah, th- there we have it, everyone. You know, if we're if you're looking to grow your startup um, with SEO, if you're looking to just progress where your business is at in terms of SEO so far, you know, creating that roadmap that focuses on clear, uh, click objectives, KPI and KPIs set so that you can understand your progress over time. You know, this is the essential strategy to setting up that roadmap and getting that early stage growth for your business, or even further, you know, launching. Uh, anything that's particularly new or just essentially propelling your efforts, your current efforts, right? And actually exponent, looking for exponential growth. So David, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add in particular, but to the, to anything that we've covered today so far, but you know, do you? Last thing, let me see if I can, can throw one more, one more piece of value out there. Um, we covered some of the big ones, the above the fold content, the, the foundation, the website, um, the, uh, the algorithm, algorithmic approach to, to gaining exponential um, results and, and the KPIs that, that are going to be indicators and, and kind of, uh, you know, guides along your journey up the mountain. Um, I think we covered a, a, a lot for today. There's, there's definitely, I, I want to try to add some, some extra value here, guys, but uh um, I think this is probably good for 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 right now. Just be, we'd probably need to do a part two to this, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it'd be amazing to have you back on here because I feel like there's so much more we can cover and 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 so much more value and questions that everyone may have that we can actually answer, right? So it'd be good. So I mean, this has been amazing and insightful, and I definitely think that this chat, I feel like it's going to be you know, people can take some real actionable insights away from this um, and actually use it as part of their their roadmap, which is amazing. But David, even if people do have questions, as you know, everyone, you can find me, you know, with any of the links that I usually provide to my Instagram, my LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and, you know, you can feel free to sort of comment if you're watching this on, on the YouTube uh, version of this episode. But David, where can people reach out to you? Where can people follow you? Or even if if we have potential people in the audience, you know, wanting to get some guidance on their current SEO efforts, where can, how can people get to you? Absolutely. So you can get to me, um, at David at peaks, digital marketing.com. So via email, I also have, um, you know, social media, David, a Finberg do a lot of tips and tricks and, you know, we save the big, the big stuff for these podcasts that you'll find some, some additional little, uh, tips and tricks there. You can also reach out to, um, to us via the website peaks, P E A K S plural, uh, digital marketing.com. Um, and we're, we're doing free audits and we're just looking at, add some value. So if there's any questions or things that, uh, that we can help with, we'd love to be a service. Awesome. And for, for those of you that didn't quite catch that, right. I will, don't worry. I'll, link them below where you can actually reach out to David's LinkedIn and, and also the website and all. So it's a lot easier for you guys to sort of get in touch with. But David, it's been amazing you having uh, amazing having you here. Uh, so thanks for coming on to the show. Um, if everyone liked today's video, if you listen to this on a video or even if you listen to it on the podcast platform like Spotify or Apple Podcasts or um, Anchor or whatever it is nowadays, um, because there's a bunch of platforms, you know, if you want to see more, just Give us a follow. You know, if you'd like to ask any questions, see more episodes in the in the future, just comment below, you know, what sort of questions you have and maybe we can answer them in the future and, and collaborate once again. Um, otherwise, I'd appreciate if you hit that like button, subscribe, and uh, yeah, we look to see you in the future soon. So David, I hope you have a wonderful day as well and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. I had a blast. I really appreciate um, the opportunity. No worries. Take it easy, everyone, and speak soon. Bye.